Hi, I'm Melissa. And I'm Candace. This is The Build Up, where we discuss the secrets to building wealth through real estate. Every episode, we hit on the hottest headlines, give expert advice, and interview an interesting guest who's made the pivot to real estate from tech founders to professional athletes and everything in between. Candace and I have sold over half a billion dollars in real estate in one of the toughest markets in the world, New York City. And we're here to break down the barriers to investing so you can build up your wealth. Today, we're going to be discussing the return to office debate and its impact on commercial real estate. We're also going to be discussing the pros and cons of our first real estate investing strategy, Ground Up Development, and talking more about this strategy with our special guest, tech founder, John Roa. This episode is presented by Brown Harris Stevens, a luxury residential real estate firm located throughout New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, and South Florida. We're so fortunate to be filming filming today at the Trophy Penthouse of View, New York, located at 368 3rd Avenue here in Manhattan. View is known for its spectacular views and for its elevated design. The penthouse we're in now is priced at $10 million. If you're interested in View and its remaining residences, please visit their website at viewnewyork.com. Let's jump right in it. Uh, you know, a topic that we've been tracking really closely that's been trending in the headlines is the return to office debate. Um, JP Morgan actually just abandoned their hybrid policy. Wow. And companies such as Starbucks, Disney, and Amazon have mandated their employees to return to the office three times a week. And this is coming after companies have observed that teams who are in the office in some sort of hybrid capacity or full time have resulted in better business and culture. Now that makes a lot of sense, but there is another side of the coin and there's been a number of surveys that have come out showing that employees are really pushing back on these new mandates to be in the office full time, so much so that some of them are even willing to take pay cuts. Mm. Good Hire actually did a survey and of the 3,500 workers they polled, 61%, so wow. the majority of them were willing to take a pay cut in exchange for working from home permanently. And not just any pay cut, some said they'd be willing to take up to 50%. 50%? Yeah. So. Wow. I don't know about you, but I can't take a 50% pay cut. So I'm not really sure how that's going to all like work out, but that's how strongly a lot of these employees are feeling about their freedom and flexibility to work from home. For sure. And you know, the employees who are returning to work, they're feeling very pressured, right? A lot of times they are actually fearing job security. Which begs the question that if people are feeling forced to be in the office somewhere they don't want to be, then will it actually improve productivity and culture? Right. But personally speaking, right? And I'm sure you can agree, especially with real estate. It's it's a people business, right? You have to be in front of people. And for us, I love being in the HQ, right? You're in front of your team, you're building camaraderie, you're in front of your manager, and it also helps with career advancement opportunities. For sure. I, of course, agree. I think it's true for many industries, but especially in ours, we don't have that luxury to work from home because you'll be missing out with not being in front of people and really connecting with them. Yeah, I mean, look, like we're always going to keep track of this because one of the main reasons is that the return to office has a huge impact on commercial real estate and the overall market as a whole. Didn't we just read, right? Didn't we read a New York Times article? We did. Yeah, that one was really interesting. It said that there's 998 million square feet wow. of available office space across the United States. So putting on our residential hats for a minute, mm -hmm. um, that is about 13% of the market that could theoretically be turned into apartments. But the question is, can we actually do that? I mean, it's really difficult. Um, I read a study by Moody's that only 3% of all of the office buildings in New York City is viable for conversion. Only three. Think about that. That's 35 out of the 1,100 buildings. I mean, that's not a lot at all. And for the ones that do make sense, it's really expensive. We're talking 400 to 500 price per square foot. Um, I get this. My mind was blown actually at this one, but that is actually more than constructing a brand new ground up new development. That is shocking. And I think the only way this can become more viable is if, you know, no shocker here, but is that there is a correction in the prices of these office buildings. Mm -hmm. And look, like as people do come back to the offices, they're expecting class A office building with every amenity you can think of. So it's really these older buildings that are left in the balance and would be more prime for conversion since they're less suitable in their current state as an office building. Yeah, and speaking of cost, um, do you know how much remote work is actually costing Manhattan right now? Nope. <laughs> I was reading in a Stanford University study, it's costing the city $12.4 billion a year. Wow. 
That's really shocking. Yeah. I wouldn't expect it to be that high. Exactly. Well, they figure the average worker is spending 5K less per year because they're in the office 30% less. And if you times that by the 2.7 million people in the city, you get... $12.4 billion. I mean, that is super shocking, especially because that's only for the impact it has on the market here in Manhattan, let alone the entire country. So this is clearly a very complex topic, and we're really going to be watching to see how this all evolves. Definitely. Well, switching gears, we're going to be diving into our first real estate investing strategy, residential ground up development. Well, of course, leave it to us. We pick one of the more complex and risky strategies to discuss today. Um, as the name suggests, uh, developers, they choose a piece of land and they turn it into operating real estate. And depending on the deal, they could either A, sell it or rent it. Ground up development is probably going to be one of the more complex strategies that we break down on this show, but it's a very important one and it should be tackled by someone who has at least some prior real estate investing experience, but <laughs> the more the better. Exactly. That'd be ideal. But tell us, you, I mean, we, we spoke about it where we know it's very risky. It's very complex. Why would someone want to get into real estate ground up development? Well, there's a number of reasons. One of the best benefits of ground up development is that it's inherently customizable. So unlike when you're renovating an existing space or converting one, it really gives you the opportunity to build it from scratch and really build it to maximize the site's highest and best use, which should maximize your investment. Right. So that really just plays perfectly into what we were saying earlier about the office space. And it makes sense why it would actually be so costly. Exactly. And, and the other issue with some of these older buildings that you wouldn't have if you're building new is that you, you can really leverage all of the advancements in construction and design and technology to really build a more sustainable project, which will result in less maintenance expense over the lifetime of the property. But let's face it, one of the biggest draws of ground up development is that it can be very lucrative. A well analyzed and executed deal can generate annualized returns up to 25% depending on the deal. Wow. So this is really a strategy for someone who wants to go big or go home. Those are really enticing numbers, right? So how do developers realize these returns? There's a number of ways. The first way is called a fee-only model, and under this structure, a developer will either put in no to very little equity into the deal, and in exchange, they will charge a fee for their services. Well, this is sounding like it'd be perfect for someone, and correct me if I'm wrong, but for someone who has very little experience and they're trying to build their portfolio, or even perhaps someone who don't really have that much liquid capital. Exactly. That would be well suited for that because the other type is called develop to sell or develop to lease. And in these scenarios, you're going to assume all of the ownership risk mm -hmm. until you can sell the property or lease it up. And that's when you'll finally get your return. We know firsthand that this is a very long process, right? So how does time play into real estate development? So like anything in life, timing is everything. And it's even more true here is that can be really one of your greatest variables that are really outside of your control as a developer. And so what's hard about it is that you're forced to make bets on where supply, demand, pricing is all going to be years out from when you're actually buying the property and when the project will be completed. And so it doesn't matter how many times you've done it or how good your research is, it's impossible to get that right 100% of the time. So in lies all of that risk that we're talking about. And the other downside of development is that it's years of upfront exhaustive work and outlay of capital and until you can really realize any type of return. And then on top of that, the profits aren't even guaranteed if things don't go according to plan. So that's quite difficult. And then I think the other unique challenge with development is that developers are required to have a really good understanding of many facets of the industry rather than just specializing in one. So they really have to have a good understanding of construction, design, zoning, commercial financing, and so on. And so it really takes time before you can really acquire all of that knowledge and put the pieces together. What about someone with no experience? I mean, we started our business with zero experience. What would you advise someone who is like, hey, I want to make those returns someday. What would you advise them at the this point with no experience. So yeah, there's a number of things you can do if you still want to get into development and you're lacking in experience. The first thing you can do is you can work for someone who has a great track record, really good experience, and some has a portfolio that you might want to emulate yourself. 
Um, the other thing you can do is potentially partner or joint venture with someone who maybe has a skill set that you feel you're lacking. For example, maybe you're really comfortable with the construction process, but you're not as fluent when it comes to commercial financing. So you partner with someone who has those mm -hmm. skill sets that you feel you're lacking. And then if you feel like you've really acquired as much knowledge as you're going to be able to before you start your first and you're really ready to make that jump, you can also start small, right? Like that's always a great way to kind of get, get your feet wet and minimize some of that risk, that down Downside, all the costs going into it. So starting small is also a great way to get in. I mean, it's no easy feat no matter how you look at it, but I do agree that mentorship is super important and that's something that we really advocate as well. This actually makes today's conversation very interesting and engaging with seven times tech founder, John Roa, that's built not one, but two ground up development. And one he sold and the other he turned into a cash flowing luxury rental. And as if that's not enough, he built it in one of the most interesting destinations, Mykonos, Greece. Sounds exotic. Yes. <laughs> All right, so big interview today. Welcome lifelong entrepreneur, founder of seven tech companies, philanthropist, activist, published author, and the main reason you're here today, though, is because you're an international real estate developer. Welcome to The Build Up, John Roa. Thanks for having me. That's quite the track record, John. <laughs> Tell us, where do you get your drive? Um, it's a great question. You know, I've been asked that a lot, and I don't exactly know. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 14 years old. Um, it's all I've known. I can't recall a time before that. I also didn't know that's what I was. You know, I grew up in a family that didn't have any entrepreneurs, that didn't have any kind of technical people. And so for some reason, I just kind of found my own path and have always been a self-starter. Um, when I saw something I wanted, if it didn't exist, I built it. If I had an idea, I want to create it. That's just always been the mindset. And that's led to everything I've done in tech and now in real estate. So what was your first business that you started? The very first one was a uh, computer repair company, kind of like the geek squad before geek squad. <laughs> and um, it was back in, at a time when people didn't know how to fix our computers and I'd go around the local community and do that for, for people and made a great little living off that in high school. Do you count that as one of the seven companies you of course. started? Of <laughs> course, that, that was a very real company. Uh, I made more money on that than most of my companies. So most of your businesses are tech focused, mm -hmm. but are they in any area specifically or had they all looked the same? No, I mean, tech's the one common thread to all of it. Um, I would say, you know, apart from tech, um, I've tried to always have a focus on kind of like design and applications and, and consumer experience, but it's gone everywhere from video games to data to design. So, you know, really across the spectrum. And is anyone in your family in real estate or were you ever interested in real estate as a kid? No, not, not at all. Um, you know, I, I never really understood the profession. I'm not sure I still understand the profession, but I, I have taken a crack at it a couple of times. Um, I think I found my way to real estate just because I'm fascinated by the creation of the design side of real estate. And so for me, it played into building the right offices and kind of ecosystems for my companies mm -hmm. and then ultimately building the right homes for myself. That's kind of how it all played out. Right. So you sold your business, right, mm -hmm. in 2015, and then you pivot to real estate. Kind of, yeah. That was quite the pivot, right? Very different. What inspired you to get into real estate there? It wasn't for the real estate. It was that, you know, after I sold my company, um, you know, life changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And it was really an opportunity to uh, try some new things and live in different places. And so I spent the next five and a half years in Europe. And it was through that experience that I was on an island in Greece and decided to build a home for myself and stay there for a number of years. So it wasn't that I wanted to be in real estate. It's that I wanted to build something conducive to my lifestyle and a change in my lifestyle. And that happened to be a home. And so that led to becoming, I guess, what what you'd call an international real estate developer. Mm -hmm. uh, not It wasn't the goal to be that. It was the goal to create something for myself. Learned a lot, had mm -hmm. some crazy experiences, and um, you know, still wouldn't call myself a real estate expert, but something that I was very glad I did you know, at that mm -hmm. point in my life. So tell us why Greece, and specifically why Mykonos? <laughs> Uh, Greece was just because I wanted to change everything. You know, I had spent the last, at that point, 15 years between like all the major American cities, basically, mm -hmm. um, you know, working, building companies and never had since I was 14 years old, a real break in my life, a real time to, to not be doing that. And so when I had that opportunity, um, Greece was by accident. I was just happened to be there and kind of decided it was a nice place and I'll stay. I mean, uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's it is a beautiful. Great place. Um, 
but there wasn't more strategy than that. I got lucky coming across the island of Mykonos as it was on one of its upswings. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been popular for a very long time, like way longer than, than especially Americans would, mm-hmm. would understand and kind of recognize because it's only become popular here for the last, I don't know, three or four it's years. It's a of New York City. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and so I got lucky with that. And so far as I caught it as it was, as you know, brands like Soho House and Four Seasons mm-hmm. and everybody else was trying to get a foothold there. And so buying property, building not one, but actually two houses there uh, was just pure luck of the draw that I did it at the right time. Um, but it was really, again, it, real estate became conducive to my lifestyle, not mm-hmm. the opposite. Right. So tell us a little bit more about how you stumbled across these property, the land really, cause you yeah. built it from scratch. So tell us a little bit how you found it and what kind of clicked in your head that said, I'm going to build these off the side of a cliff from what we saw in the pictures. That's what <laughs> it looks like. But <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that process and then what you ultimately ended up with. As I think back on it, it sounds crazier than I realized at the time. Um, at the time it was like, I want to, I want to have a place here and I want to, I want to buy something that, um, would be a place to, you know, visit in the summers. I think as a lot of people do, like if you have, if you're lucky enough to be able to do that, sometimes, you know, you can you have this vision for what it would look like. So as I began to shop for places that you could buy that were on the market, mm-hmm. um, I couldn't find that thing. I couldn't, I never walked in somewhere and went, oh, this is, this is what I want. And this is what I, where I want to live. And kind of the vision in my head was somewhat apart from what I could purchase. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, as a, I don't know, I guess as an entrepreneur or as a builder, you're like, all right, well, screw that. Like, why not just make it? Right. right. And that was the jump. And again, to my head, it sounded totally logical. To the next person, it might sound totally insane. But I just kind of said, like, if I can't buy it, I might as well make it. And so I came across a broker who um, seemingly knew the island and knew how to how to guide me in the process, who <laughs> I guess ironically advised me to probably not do it because of how risky it is and how many oh, people wow. have lost money by <laughs> yeah. trying to do this. Uh, I ignored that and did it anyway. <laughs> and, um, you know, didn't know the island intimately, but still knew what I wanted. And mm-hmm. so when he showed me land, raw land where you could build, I saw three or four, they were fine, came across one and kind of went, oh, well, this is it. And just That's instantly it. knew that, that if I was gonna do it, this is gonna be what it was. Why, so. well, how did you know? I mean, it's Greece, right? So the, you're only there you, you know, you're not there to do anything but enjoy the land you're at. Mm-hmm. And so it is about views. It is about proximity, uh, about the uniqueness of that. Right. You know, no one's thinking about, you know, commutes or no one's thinking <laughs> about, you know, whatever. It's purely about when you stand there, what is your experience? Because that's going to be your experience at your home. And this one happened to be on a cliff 400 feet in the air above the sea looking due south, mm-hmm. which is kind of the best vantage you get from those areas. Again, where I got lucky this is where you want to be kind of more lucky than, than good sometimes is because of the wind system through the island of Mykonos specifically. I didn't really know this, but two thirds of the island is not wind protected. And mm-hmm. so you can be out of your ho- your home, walk out with a coffee and it'll fly out of your hand oh, wow. because That's... it's so windy. And so you only want to be really in the southwest corridor of the island. Totally unbeknownst to me at the time, but that's what I, where I ended up buying. So pure luck got lucky. Um, and so, you know, it just, it just felt right. Again, I, it's not very good advice because, you know, I know that especially in real estate, you got to go off fund- fundamentals more than gut. Uh, but that's how I approached it. It also sounds like you had a good broker. <laughs> you guided <laughs> yes, you right. <laughs> I, I did actually. Um, and you know, for him to say, here are the risks, mm-hmm. like here's why you might not want to do this. And here's where people who've tried this before you have mm-hmm. failed. That was helpful. Right. Instead of just trying to get me to buy something. Right. right? right. So that I valued that. And he ended up, of course, because it's Greece, everyone does kind of everything. He ended up being the general contractor mm. who built the house. <laughs> and so we still have a relationship to this day. I talked to him a few hours ago. And um, so it ended up being, you know, a long term, very real relationship. Did he do anything else for you or just general contract and broker? It, it, literally everything. Because I mean, except like the I would say the legal and accounting, you know, everything past that was him. Um, as a non-Greek who doesn't speak Greek, Mm -hmm. who's also not in real estate, you can imagine that I started at a great disadvantage, Mm -hmm. right? I didn't know the, I didn't know the literal language or the language of the land of like how to get business done, how even the customs work, Mm -hmm. how the process is different than it is here in the U S. So he translated all of that literally and figuratively. Um, and had, you know, I, I got involved with somebody who wouldn't have done that or not done it in good faith, mm-hmm. it could have been a disaster. Yeah. And so it was, you know, again, that was luck, not skill. Um, but that was an important piece of the puzzle. 
And that actually segues really great into my next question because look, like the property is beautiful. We've seen it um, and it sounds like you were very lucky, but talk to us about the challenges, right? About building in a foreign country. You yourself yeah. said you didn't even speak the language, but what was that learning curve like for you? I mean, the curve was steep and <laughs> it, it was extremely hard, harder mm -hmm. than I ever expected. Cause I had dabbled in aspects of real estate. Mm -hmm. You know, my former company, we built, I forget what the number was, 20,000 feet of office space or something like that. I mean, just tons of space, mm -hmm. which I led the entire process of from designing every room and wall to organizing and managing the contractors and the GCs. And so I participated in the process, mm -hmm. right? And so I at least knew like at a very high level what it looks like, how to kind of gauge when it's going well or not, you know, whatever. The complexities of doing it internationally were significant mm -hmm. and the differences, you know, first of all, when you literally can't speak the language, you are relying and you're trusting people like crazy. I mean, you're signing multi-page documents that you cannot read a word of. Crazy. Right. Which is a weird experience, <laughs> right? That is weird. You're having somebody say here, I promise you this is what it says. <laughs> that's a lot of trust. Sign it and you're like, all right, you know, yeah. so that that's a weird process in itself. Building on, a, on an island mm -hmm. is a whole nother aspect because what should be simple becomes immensely complex. Raw materials, labor, um, weather, you know, things that you just wouldn't take into account otherwise mm -hmm. are, are wildly complex. Customs for just the, the customs of the culture and how they do business and what they care about and how they care about it, even how literal business gets done. Like what is a meeting? Mm -hmm. Like for us, it's you sit down, you shake right. hands, you talk business and you stand up and you carry on, right? Uh, that's not the case in other places, mm -hmm. including in Greece. Like the customs of how to do business and what is said when and what, what yes or no really means mm -hmm. is, is different. What a promise means, mm -hmm. you know, you will, ex you will get this Friday. Right. That might mean not that. mean you will get this Friday, right? So like there's a lot you have to quickly understand and then you run into a decision, mm -hmm. which is I know how I do business mm -hmm. and how we do business in America, which is a trap that a lot of Americans fall into when they try to do international business, which is like, this is how I know how to do this and mm -hmm. I'm gonna get you to do it like me, mm -hmm. which is very hard. Or I'm gonna lean in and, and try to do business like you and I'm gonna try to adapt and I'm gonna try to play by your rules and your game, mm -hmm. which is also very hard, but you gotta do one and you can't really vacillate. Mm -hmm. Do you, does one story stand out to you in terms of doing business with the Greeks and what that was like? Because you mentioned it's very different there than it is here. So what's like your best example for how it's so different there than here? There's a lot of stories, some probably not appropriate <laughs> for a podcast. Um, if I had to pick one, I would say um, what I'll give one good and one bad. And I wouldn't say this is Greece. This is just building mm -hmm. uh, stuff, especially building in places where it's less modern, you know, I mean, they still wholly build like they did thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. right? Similar materials, similar types of labor. And what was amazing and probably the coolest part of it was nothing was out of a catalog. You didn't look at a kitchen and say, right, I'll have this right. cabinet or look at this wall and say, I'll have this covering. You could imagine anything because everything's made by hand and these, these artisans were making it. Um, you know, we wanted these rock walls, you know, to look a certain way and like the way I, and again, maybe it's just cause I've never, you know, hired somebody to make a rock wall, but like <laughs> you think there'd be some kind of an automated process right. in some capacity. Right. And you'd see these guys you know, with chisel and rock, wow. just, just, you know, literally. And then they'd use this material, which is kind of like cement, but it was more like natural. And they're literally physically just creating this stuff. And it was, it was wild. It's not. It's not a machine in sight. It's not a tool in sight. Crazy. And that that was amazing because yeah, there was cool. no limitation to like, oh, we build this way, or here's what a steel rod can support. It was like you know you can just create. In terms of like a negative was probably that because of how few you know restrictions. There's no code. There's no surveys. There's mm -hmm. no things that we would take for granted that kind of like build frameworks for some of this mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, everything was very loose mm -hmm. and you'd find yourself in situations where you thought things would go in one direction, they just go totally different direction mm -hmm. and there's no rhyme or reason for those things. Right. Um, and, and you do realize why those can be very valuable, you know, mm -hmm. in certain aspects. 
Right. We spoke a lot about the challenges, right? We talked about your learning curve, but what would you say was the most positive outcome of this experience? Except, of course, you sold one and mm -hmm. <laughs> you turned the other into cash flowing. But I'm talking about the process of building. I mean, again, real estate to me, aside from like my offices, have been conducive to my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it facilitated an incredible five years of my life. It was where I lived, it's where I hosted my friends, it's where I still vacation today. So it was a catalyst for a, a tenth or more than that, 15% of my life, mm -hmm. right? Was spent on that island in places that I built. So those properties and the experience that surrounded them um, were, were literally life-changing and therefore real estate affected mm -hmm. my life in a, in a massive way. Um, had I bought some other place that like I didn't, have that kind of impact on, it wouldn't have meant as much. Mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't want to spend as much time there. I certainly wouldn't have made, you know, the, the friends that I made, the other business ventures I got involved in, like a beach restaurant, those kind of things, were only because I was there in December when no one else is there. Mm -hmm. So I meet the locals. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm i there as part of the, the process of the island. Whereas had I just shown up for a month in summer, it, that would have never happened. Mm -hmm. And so the process of doing that development led to, I mean, literally endless positive things that came out of that. That's amazing. And so given that you, it did all end pretty well for you, would you consider doing it again? Maybe somewhere else, maybe in Greece? I mean, the, the learnings that I take away from are, it was incredibly um, insightful. It was, I learned a lot. It obviously led to a game changing experience. The downsides were also significant, right? Of just, how much risk I kind of realized I took almost too late. Um, thankfully it worked out, but like it, it couldn't, it, there's mm -hmm. ways it wouldn't have or couldn't have. Right. And those are the, some of the stories I had heard. Uh, and so would I want to take on that kind of risk again? Probably not. Right. Um, I, think I have a better sense for kind of like where I am and who I am and, and what I have the, the, the kind of risk tolerance for these days. Um, I also observed a market that when I got involved was going straight up into the right, mm -hmm. COVID then took it straight down to the right. Mm -hmm. And now it's somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so just watching kind of like macro volatility and global volatility, mm -hmm. you know, that Mykonos specifically, even further than just Greece is in a very volatile part of the world. And you kind of realize like that headline that you would have ignored could now have a direct impact on, you know, the veracity of your investment. And so like, I don't want to worry about that kind of thing. Like I'm not really in the place now, especially running a new company and doing what I'm doing now where like, I, I want to wake up at three o'clock in the morning because of a headline that came out of, mm -hmm. you know, the Middle East or out of Cyprus or out of somewhere else in Europe that could affect my investment. You know, like that's not yeah. really the mindset anymore. Um, but with that said, I mean, I think real estate will always be a part of my life. One thing I think developers here take for granted is how easy it is to get access to financing. So tell us about how that process was like in Greece, because I think it's our understanding there isn't really access to leverage there. Yeah. So talk to us about that. There's not. Um, after Greece crashed and, and after the EU bailout, um, it is somewhere, somewhere between difficult and impossible to get uh, financing on real estate, even for on a mortgage. It almost doesn't exist. I mean, I'm sure it's coming back a bit now, years later, and now that Greece is doing better. Um, but it was it was a cash game. You can kind of get sucked into this mindset of like, you see how hot the island is and how much it's growing and how much mm -hmm. money is flowing around. And the, and the brands that are frankly like the best in the world on making good bets, mm -hmm. like a Soho House or a Four Seasons or a Nobu or all these brands that were coming in, and you can kind of allow yourself to go, well, I'll take more risk and I'll put more cash in. And I I'd maybe behave in a way that I wouldn't otherwise, because look what's happening around me. You can kind of get a little bit kind of lost in the allure of that mm -hmm. and make a decision that you might not make just because it's just on paper. Yeah. I mean, I, I did my projects 100 percent cash. That's crazy. Which <laughs> is just crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, again, for me, I'm glad they worked out. Had I picked a different island two years earlier or later, it might not have. Right. So like. You know, I don't want to pretend that it was like skill or that I saw the market or some crazy, you know, craziness because that wasn't the case. Uh, but, you know, it did reframe my thinking a lot on kind of how I proceed with that. But, yeah, 
financing in general is completely different in different parts of the world. And we do take it for granted here than secrets. Yeah, but in terms of, you know, you did it internationally, right? So we're talking about doing it nationally here versus internationally. What would you say is the one thing that you would advise someone who's listening that would say, hey, I want to do internationally besides telling them they're crazy, of course. <laughs> I think either starting with some kind of local resource that mm -hmm. you inherently trust, you know, mm -hmm. a family member, a friend of a family member, like a, somebody where you can have a firm footing that mm -hmm. because everything will start from there. Mm -hmm. They'll introduce you to one person, who introduce the next person, but as long as the, the beginning of that is solid, the chances of it being solid three degrees away are better than walking the streets of Athens and just saying the first lawyer <laughs> I come across is who I'm gonna hire, right? right? Not to say I did that, but like, I think, of you know a really stable footing and, and figuring out that like no matter what that person you can trust and therefore you're going to do as much as you can to route through and get you know um almost like acceptance criteria in a way from like that person i would say is that would be the key that i would tell somebody mm -hmm. if, if it was me you know doing it again and how did you meet your local partner in greece through a friend and it's the same kind of thing so the the first kind of like you know through through friends i trusted i met uh, somebody on the island mm -hmm. who, um, again, this is a bit of instinct, but you can just tell it would be mm -hmm. somebody you can trust and somebody who would, who was a good person and those kind of things. And from that person is who I kind of said, if I was going to buy or build, who's the, who's the only and first person that you'd recommend and then use that one. And then you went from there. So, but again, it wasn't for that resource in the middle. Mm -hmm. Um, had that person not been trustworthy and worked out, it, it would have gone a different direction. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you need just like a catalyst, the whole thing. Right. So <laughs> you've done a lot, but predominantly tech, mm -hmm. right? And now you've done real estate. Which one do you think is harder? I don't know. They're both ridiculously hard. I think tech is harder because of the lower barrier to entries. You need to do a lot to do real estate. You know, I mean, if you're going to be a passive investor, maybe less, right? You, you can put your money somewhere and buy into a real estate, you know, REIT or an ETF and just call it a day. But if you're going to be an active in real estate, if you're going to build, if you're going to manage, if you're going to whatever, that's hard. And, it, and, it, and it's hard enough where the average person isn't going to go do it. Um, and so I think that it, it self selects. Mm -hmm. Tech can be very easy to enter. You, you know, you learn how to program and all of a sudden you built an app and all of a sudden you're in tech, right? So it's like, you look at how many people are in tech compared to like, like real real estate, and it would be significantly different. And so I think that that makes tech harder. There's more noise, there's more BS, there's more, I think, you know, delusions of grandeur. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you create a building, you kind of know where like the best and worst case scenario right. is, mm -hmm. right? I guess worse would be nothing, or probably even not, right? I mean, even if you buy bad, there's something there, there's right. land. Like you, mm -hmm. you kind of know that like, okay, worst case scenario, it's like here. And best case, if I absolutely knock it out of the park, it's that times 20 or something. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can like gate the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Whereas in tech, it can be zero or like trillions of dollars. <laughs> and so it's like, I think that just creates a whole, you know, ecosystem that makes it in some ways more difficult. But real estate is freaking hard. And so I, I would say that like, having been down both paths, you know, I, it's hard to say which one is is objectively harder, because they both have their serious challenges. And if you can make it in either, you you're doing pretty well. And as you look forward, how do you envision real estate fitting into your portfolio? I think it, it'll continue to enhance my lifestyle. I think that whether it's where I live, how I want to live, um, whether it creates the income that furthers, you know, my investment strategies, whether it um, opens up new opportunities in, in you know my life where I might not have participated in a in a deal or seen a part of the world had I not you know kind of got involved in real estate I think that it'll continue to enhance my lifestyle rather than becoming you know a profession mm -hmm. or something like that yeah but this has been a great conversation John thank you so much for all of your insights I think we all felt like we learned something here today yeah, so for sure thank you again thank you Thank you, John, for that insightful conversation. We've been working with developers for over 10 years, and even we learned something new today. 
We certainly did, and we've covered a lot of ground. We spoke about the return to office debate and its impact on commercial real estate. We broke down the pros and cons, the risks and rewards of ground up development, and we dove into this topic with our guest, John Roa. We'd like to thank our sponsors again, Brown Harris Stevens and View New York for hosting us here today. You can find us on our website at tower.com and our social media at tower. Until next time, see you then.